welcome to the COVID-19 coronavirus town hall here in DeKalb County. We have a lot of information to bring to you. We want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedules. I know a lot of you are working from home, a lot of you are home with your kids. And so you've got a lot of things going on in the background, but we're grateful that you're taking some time out to get information. And that's exactly what we're going to give you tonight. A lot of information so that you can make some good decisions. More about that in a moment. But the person who put all of this together is DeKalb County CEO. You know, one of the things that uh, elected officials, among so many things, elected officials have to deal with how to communicate to their constituents, how to let people know what's going on without panicking them, without instilling fear, and making sure that everybody understands. Communication is a key uh, is a key element to all of this and us getting through this crisis. And so CEO Michael Thurman has uh, devised this town hall for all of you on uh, the DeKalb County website, on Twitter, and on Facebook to enable you to hear from the experts in our community and to ask them questions yourselves so that you can be better prepared as we all journey through this difficult time. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, ask our CEO, Michael Thurman, to open our program. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and I would like to welcome all the viewers, those who are engaging and interacting with us on the multiple platforms to our second uh, DeKalb uh, County Virtual Town Hall as we continue to uh, respond to and address uh, this health care crisis in DeKalb across this nation and literally around the world. I want to thank Ms. Brenda Woods, a legendary journalist who has taken the time away from her vacation to come and be with us tonight. And so we are socially distanced, but let's give Ms. Wood a round of applause <laughs> for being here with us. She is a phenomenal, uh, not just a journalist, but a phenomenal person who has spent her entire career uh, investing over 40 years, uh, making sure that people are informed and educated. And thank you so much, Ms. Wood, for coming and being with us today. Uh, now I would like to stop and introduce uh, a gentleman here in DeKalb County, there's the CEO's office, but nothing of substance happens in DeKalb County government without the support of our board of commissioners. And I am honored to have a colleague and a friend, a man I admire with us today, our presiding officer of the DeKalb County Board of Commissioners, the Honorable Steve Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. These are interesting times, to say the least. Coronavirus has presented us with some challenges, but these are challenges that we will meet and ultimately overcome together. On behalf of my colleagues on the Board of Commissioners, I'm here this evening to stand in solidarity with our CEO, Michael Thurman, and to underscore the point that we are unified as the governing authority of DeKalb County. We are unified. I would like to thank the dedicated and hardworking professionals who have been guiding us through this process. I have tremendous respect for your individual and collective knowledge and expertise, and I will be deferring to that. My message to the citizens of DeKalb County is very simple. We will all get through this together. Thank you, Mr. CEO, for your tremendous leadership and for the honor and privilege of standing by your side this evening. Thank you, Presiding Officer Bradshaw, and for our fellow county commissioners who are tuned in and listening, I want to thank our Presiding Officer, Mr. Bradshaw. I want to thank the Board of Commissioners, uh, not just for their support during this crisis, but their ongoing support throughout my tenure as CEO of DeKalb County. Uh, our job as a county government is to ensure that essential services are delivered in a seamless manner. We do that by working with many of our partners in the public and private sector, and you will hear from them shortly. The Board of Health, uh, our DeKalb County School District, our fellow elected officials uh, in various municipalities around our county, as well as some of our major educational and academic institutions. But our primary role as the DeKalb County government is to ensure that critical services continue to be delivered. And the most essential of all of those services that we provide is to ensure that safe, drinkable water is available to our 750,000 residents 
and the thousands of individuals who work and live and play in our community. That continues to be and is our highest priority uh, during this ongoing healthcare crisis. And that along with public safety, uh, our sanitation department, protecting the roads, continues to be and will be and will be de delivered in a professional manner. Uh, we have implemented and developed a uh, emergency protocol that will assure that our workers, number one, are protected, but number two, that we will be here for the citizens through, through their taxes and their fees, finance the operation of this government. Uh, you will hear more from our uh, director of the Scott County Water Treatment Facility. DeKalb County has one source of fresh drinking water and we have one facility that actually treats and provides that water to our citizens. We have taken extreme precautions to protect the workforce who will man this particular facility throughout this crisis and 365 days around the year. We have for you a video that highlights the men and women who put themselves oftentimes in harm's way to keep us safe and protected. They're the men and women in uniform and fire rescue and police. They're 911 operators, but they are also men and women who work behind the scenes, whose faces you may never see, but who have answered the call to service, who are true servant leaders, and who without their uh, uh, contributions, we would not be able to operate this government and secure a high quality of life for our citizens. So please uh, take note and take time when you get a moment to thank the men and women who will be highlighted uh, in this video. As we all prepare to live under the guise of our new normal, some of life's most basic essentials of the days of old still persist. As attempts to slow the spread of COVID-19 have resulted in the mandate of social distancing, DeKalb County government has employed a new strategy to ensure that life is sustained and protected. That strategy, socially distant service delivery. We want you to know that we are prepared, we are focused, and we will do whatever is necessary to continue to protect the health and safety of our citizens. DeKalb County officials monitor the pandemic and strategize for the most effective and efficient way to continue to serve, including readying additional first responders to be deployed if needed and employing a virtual triage method in the county's 911 center. When you call in, we're asking a series of questions and we're trying to determine whether or not you're showing the symptoms. And again, if you are symptomatic, that allows us to let police, fire, and EMS take the proper measures before they ever get on scene. Strategically armed with more information on what to expect, our first responders are even better prepared to continue to serve and protect. We're still running approximately 350 calls a day. Um, those calls are related not only to fire, but our EMS calls. And some of those calls may require our folks to take the extra precautions uh, as it relates to COVID-19. We're making sure that the officers have masks in their vehicles. That way they can provide it if they encounter anyone that may be showing symptoms and also they can have it in case for whatever reason they may need to use it if they're in an environment where they're highly exposed. And while human to human contact may be lessened, the flow of the cab's critical services, so vital to everyday life, have not been affected. If your garbage is picked up on Monday, we will be there on Monday. Tuesday, we're going to be there on Tuesday. Wednesday, we're going to be there on Wednesday. So residents should continue to expect the same level of service that we have given prior to COVID-19 virus. It's business as usual for the county water system, as well as the sewer system. There's absolutely no impact to any of our core businesses, producing safe drinking water, transmitting it to all of our customers safely, collecting used water and treating it and discharging it back to the environment. There's no impact at all. Now, essential county services continue without interruption, but you too can do your part to help out. Sanitize your roll cart handles, Ensure all garbage is bagged. Do not flush fats, oils, and grease, nor those sanitizing wipes down the drain. 
And while hunkering down at home is becoming the new way of life for us all, the services and protection we all hold so dear prove the new way of life and the days of old are both rooted in the county's top priority, an unwavering commitment to service. I can't be more proud of the men and women of this department and their approach to what really is unprecedented in many ways. And the fact that they are still coming to work and they are still providing that service that is expected by the citizens of DeKalb County. This county depends on this government to provide critical essential services. Uh, there will be no shutdown of those services, no matter what the case might be. And now I would like to introduce to you the man uh, who is the manager of the Scott Candler Water Treatment Facility here in DeKalb County. Uh, obviously, he plays a critical role in maintaining the quality of life. Uh, he's been employed with DeKalb County for six and a half years. His professional experience involves serving on the National Board of Directors for the American Water Works Association. He served on the Georgia Wastewater Agency Response Network, and he is also a member of the Georgia Association of Water Professionals and has been a part of water utility preparedness response since 9-11. And now I would like to introduce to you an outstanding public servant, Mr. Sandy Smith. Thank you, sir, for those kind words and that introduction. It's an honor to be here tonight to represent all 600 members of the Department of Watershed Management. Uh, as said earlier tonight, this is, this is a very different threat. Uh, all 600 members of our team are constantly in a mode of increasing our preparedness and response capabilities to all hazards events. We've been closely monitoring this since, it, you know, uh, since the outbreak in China back in uh, December. Uh, as the situation unfolded and developed, we made sure that we, you know, we had our, our rock solid relationships with DeKalb Emergency Management and Georgia Emergency Management, as well as the network the CEO just mentioned, the Georgia Water and Wastewater Agency Response Network. It's a network of our brother and sister utilities all across the state and the country to where we can get resources, unforeseen resources, in case we may need them in the department. The first step with that is um, with the DeKalb Emergency Management, we've worked close with them over the years, and that was to make sure that all members of our department are intimately familiar with the COOP plan, and that stands for the Continuity of Operations Plan. Um, when that gets activated, every member of our team, all of our facilities, um, all, all of our locations, that's their game plan. They know exactly what to do. Um, to go forth and make sure that we provide those services that the citizens of DeKalb County rely on all the time. Um, a lot of that plan and things of that nature boils down to uh, site security, 24-hour uh, operation, as the CEO said, uninterrupted um, operation at all times. Um, we have done uh, a lot of technological advances at our water treatment plant in the last year, year and a half. That's putting in you know, a brand new security system, a brand new plant control system so we can effectively monitor and operate the treatment plant with, with lower resources, with some um, decrease in staff if, if, if this event starts to impact our department. Uh, we have numerous staffing schedules in place from normal 100% operations that are that are fluid, that can expand and contract to where, worst case, if we have to quarantine in place and lock down, we are prepared to support our staff and make sure that that facility runs 24-7, that, that we continually provide and produce clean, safe drinking water to the citizens of the county. Um, where we have looked at everything from our security practices to um, monitoring all traffic coming in and out of our facility. We've already restricted all public access but we're still dependent on certain services and service lines. You know, that would be our water treatment chemicals. Uh, we've uh, amped up our protocol with that to make sure that our chemical, our water treatment chemical uh, storage facilities are full all the time. We are in constant contact with our suppliers, with our disinfectants, with our coagulants, things of, uh, things of that line to make sure that there's not gonna be any interruptions in uh, service. We've identified even emergency storage locations within our facility to take extra loads in case, you know, trucking gets impacted or whatnot with this event. Um, 
we have identified even extra staff uh, to come in and, and, and help with this event. Um, we have uh, plenty, plenty of food. Um, we, are, we are designed to be a sustained operation 24 hours a day uh, to be able to you know, uh, deliver that clean, safe drinking water. Um, we have um, extra contingency plans in place to make sure that the staff is taken care of, that they are self-monitoring for, uh, for this virus. We have uh, thermal thermometers in place that, you know, that they can check their own uh, temperature or whatnot, as well as uh, that traffic that's coming in and out of the plant. So with all that in mind, we stand ready. We're still practicing. We're still preparing. We're watching this event. And um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sandy. And in conclusion, I want to also announce that beginning tomorrow, which is Friday, March 20th, 2020, through Monday, March 23rd, we will test our public health emergency protocol throughout DeKalb County with involving our 6,000 employees to assure us that if an emergency declaration is issued by my office, the CEO's office, our employees, first Frontline employees will have the support that they need in public safety, sanitation, and other areas, water treatment. Our employees who will be able to work remotely, uh, we've gone through a very intensive protocol to ensure that they have the technology needed, as well as protocols in place to continue to work in remote locations, as well as we've established an auxiliary workforce of employees who cannot work remotely and who are not frontline emergency staff will be available to be called upon if needed to fill gaps and or vacancies if in fact a major uh, emergency declaration uh, is ordered through the CEO. So now I will stop. I want to thank Mr. Smith for his words and of course we may come back to additional questions and now I would like to turn the remainder of the program over to our host and moderator, Ms. Brenda Wood. Thank you very much, Mr. Thurman. You know, I was hunkered down at home, just like a lot of you, trying to protect myself and stay safe and healthy uh, during this crisis. And frankly, I had to be talked out of my house to come here. But I, I happily did it because I want to uh, play a role, if I can, in helping uh, dispel myths and in helping to uh, disseminate factual, accurate, uh, reputable information to the people in the community that I love. I love Atlanta, and so I, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. So, uh, Mr. Thurman, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. You know, I, I as I said, I was hunkered down. I am it's just like everybody else. I brought I brought my disinfectant wipes. I wiped all over here. I arrived with my, with my gloves uh, <laughs> and used those to wipe this all down before I took my gloves off. Uh, I am trying to do everything possible to save myself, as probably you are too at home. We are here in an auditorium. Everybody is at least six feet apart. Uh, some of us even more. So we are practicing a safe social distancing here as we uh, tell you all that we're going to tell you this evening. Fear and panic are just about as rampant as the virus itself. It's just hard to hear all of this information. It's absolutely overwhelming to hear all this information coming at you all day long in real time, every two hours or so. It's changing. It's new. There's more. And it's hard to keep up with. And it really is hard not to panic and not to be fearful. You know, I spend a lot of days and nights, probably you do too, wondering, what did I touch today with my bare hands? Did I touch my face today with my bare hands? So, you know, what if I get sick? Or what if that, that scratchiness in my throat is the beginning of coronavirus? I mean, it, we're, we're all so, so scared. Will I be able to pay my bills as we see one industry after another laying off hundreds of thousands of workers? This is all something like out of the twilight zone. And so we're here because we know that you're scared. We know that you have a lot of questions. And I want to say at the front end, we are going to get through this together. 
We are going to get through this. There is isn't uh, the other side of this. And most of us will get through it without even getting sick. But some of us will. Some of us will get severely ill. We need to know how to conduct ourselves, how to make the kinds of decisions we need to make in order to be defensive in this crisis. So information coming at us at a, at a warp speed. Um, I want to let you know that our best defense is, in fact, making good decisions. But you can't make good decisions without good information. That's our best tool in this crisis. And all of the information that you're hearing, that you're hearing on the news, but you're hearing online, you're hearing from your cousin who called to say that their, you know, their aunt's ex-husband's sister works at the Pentagon, and they heard, we're going to dispel some of the things that are not true. There are lots of erroneous pieces of information out there floating around, and you've probably heard some of it. So we're here to separate fact from, from fiction, to give you the best defense, which is to make smart decisions in this crisis, and the best tool, which is to give you solid, reputable, accurate information. So with all of that said, let's get to it. We have four uh, very um, impressive experts here in the auditorium with us tonight here at the DeKalb Center uh, who are going to talk on their various areas of expertise, all of which uh, will answer a lot of your questions. And we are asking you to um, put your questions in so that they can be asked during the course of this program. I first want to introduce Dr. Alexander P. Isakoff. Dr. Isakoff is the founding executive director of Emory University's Office of Critical Event Preparedness and Response and a professor of emergency medicine. His professional experience includes service as an officer of the US Navy, consulting for the CDC, deploying with the National Disaster Medical System, and providing leadership in EMS and disaster preparedness. He is also the director of Emory's section of pre-hospital and disaster medicine, whose faculty and staff, by the way, provide medical oversight for 9-11 communication centers, 911, I should say, communication centers, first responders, and air and ground ambulance services in the metro Atlanta area. So please welcome Dr. Alexander P. Isakoff. Thank you so much for being with us. All the spread of COVID-19. Thanks so much for hosting. And it it always helps when we talk. can hear you. <laughs> it does help. You know, doctors sometimes need, uh, you know, help with the technology. Um, this is a great forum. I, I think uh, you've raised a lot of important points. Uh, you know, all, all the citizens in the community um, hearing about this COVID-19 pandemic, um, they worry about their health. They worry about the health of their family members. They worry about the health of their friends. Um, and, and getting uh, accurate information at a time like this is, is critically important. And so, you know, for all of us to, to have a, a uniform and, and well-informed message is, is important. Um, I'm a doctor, I'm an emergency medicine physician, but I'm also your neighbor. Um, I share these same concerns the, uh, that you have about um, how this illness uh, is going to impact our community. Um, and so I think there's, you know, a few things that I want to start with. Um, let's first start with what we all just do as, as citizens. Um, when the public health uh, authorities are you know, telling us about what we can do to prevent infection, like washing our hands and if we're ill, you know, staying uh, away from others and calling our doctors for some guidance about what to do next and um, coughing into your elbow and um, doing what you can to, uh, to stay isolated if you, know, you develop fever, cough, and other signs and symptoms. Uh, we've got to do everything we can to to uh, to comply with you know those instructions, um, because we got to do what we can to decrease the transmission of the illness in our community. We're starting to see a lot of other interventions too that I'm sure we'll hear more about tonight. Um, you know, getting advice about not going into crowded places, not convening in big groups, um, doing what we can to decrease the number uh, of people that are together, because that's how we slow down the transmission of the virus. And so these are things that we can do as individuals. Um, you know, doing our part to, uh, to try and slow down the acceleration of this um, uh, outbreak in, in our community. Um, specifically, uh, in my profession in healthcare, uh, 
I know you know this, but there are hundreds, thousands of people, uh, some of them in this room, that have been working for weeks um, to best prepare the health systems in our community uh, for, um, to meet the, the demands of those in the community that, that need to access health care. And that goes from the 911 call center specialist who's taking your call to the EMT or paramedic that's responding to your call um, to the, uh, the nurses and doctors and techs that uh, might meet you in, in an emergency department. It's also your doctors and nurses and support staff that are uh, helping you all get um, the services that you need um, you know, from, from clinics and from ambulatory care centers. And they've been working for weeks to, to try and increase capacity and be prepared for the community's needs in, in this um, uh, COVID-19 outbreak. And, and in doing that, it, it's obvious that not everything looks like it does normally or day to day. Um, there have been you know, a number of things that probably many people have already experienced with closure of some clinics for routine visits um, to uh, postponement of elective surgeries and elective procedures. Um, and all of that is in preparation uh, for, um, for being best able to manage the large number of people that may become ill and may need those resources. It makes more beds available in the hospital. It makes more personal protective equipment available to the healthcare personnel that are caring for ill persons. Um, if we can uh, just postpone for a while those elective procedures and, and surgeries um, that we are used to having access to on a regular basis to be ready for patients that might be sick with COVID-19. Uh, now, even with all those preparations, um, I think we are anticipating there's going to be a tremendous uh, demand for health care resources in our community. All of us as individuals are going to try to do our part to blunt that demand for services by not congregating, by slowing the spread of the disease so that all the services that are required to manage this can keep up with the demand. But, but one other way we can help is, um, is to uh, try and be mindful about, you know, if we start to develop signs and symptoms, where we could best access care. Anyone that develops, you know, fever, cough, some shortness of breath, concerns about their health should, should reach out to their, their personal physician for starters because um, the relationship you have with your doctor uh, is, is where you're going to get your best advice um, about what steps to take next. Um, you know, a vast majority of people that get sick with COVID-19, we've learned from other parts of the world that have had this outbreak, don't require hospitalization. That's, that's great news. Um, there are others in the population, um, those are our neighbors, friends, family members, that because they're uh, more senior or because they have some underlying medical problems like lung disease or heart disease or diabetes, are at risk for having some you know, more serious complications. And so you know, for those people that are gonna need the emergency department and the hospital, um, and in some cases intensive care units, um, we want to, you know, keep those resources available for them. And so people with mild illness um, shouldn't rush to the emergency department, you know, if they can help it. Call your doctor, get some advice about what to do next. A lot of people are worried and they want to get tested. Um, you've probably read in the news, testing isn't widely available just now either. And what testing is available is being prioritized uh, for healthcare personnel that need to be certain they don't have the disease so they can keep working in the hospital or for... Um, uh, essential uh, personnel in the emergency services community that have to uh, stay, you know, on duty um, to uh, to help manage uh, issues that, that come up through this COVID-19 outbreak. Um, our hope is that testing will be more widely available, but but don't go to your hospital today or to your emergency department today hoping you can get a test. Um, you're going to end up, you're going to find yourself in a crowded and busy emergency department with probably a lot of sick people. Um, and the reality is that the tests just aren't available there right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, keep looking for the messaging from public health and from, from this government and from, um, and from other uh, reliable sources about uh, when that testing might become available and when, uh, when you should seek it out. Uh, just to wrap up uh, a few thoughts, um, the doctors, nurses, EMTs, paramedics, healthcare personnel in our community, again, working for weeks to be best prepared, um, are going to do everything in their power to deliver um, quality, compassionate care for the citizens in, in DeKalb County 
um, for the citizens in the state of Georgia and really all across this nation. I come from Emory Healthcare. I'm most familiar with what's going on there, but I can tell you that health systems all over the metro Atlanta area are working um, long days every day, weekends to be best prepared for this. Um, we're going to be as ready as we can to take care of people that need help. Um, and all I can ask as a physician and as your neighbor is that you do your best too um, to try and blunt the spread of this illness by washing your hands and trying to stay away from crowded places and follow the instructions that are given uh, by uh, CDC and the DeKalb County uh, Board of Health and, and other sources. Um, stay out away from emergency departments if you just have mild illness. Please communicate with your physician about next steps, especially if you have some underlying medical conditions that could potentially put you at risk. Um, look for uh, opportunities to get tested when it's appropriate. Um, and, uh, and all together, if we can do these things, um, as has been said before, uh, we, uh, we are going to come through this um, together as a community, um, all doing our part. Um, and uh, the health system uh, is there for you. Uh, let's just uh, do what we can to, uh, to manage the demands and the needs best, best we can, given these really uh, remarkable circumstances that we find ourselves in. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Dr. Isakoff. A couple of questions before we move on. You mentioned testing. Uh, and we've heard nothing uh, uh, more than test delays here in the United States. So I wish you would talk to us some about how that has affected our ability to fight the spread of this virus and your best guess of when we might see the peak of the virus spread before that hump, as everybody talks about, begins to diminish. Um, so great questions. I, I think uh, I can tell you what, what everybody knows now. Um, that uh, even supplies to do testing are, in sh are really in short supply. So um, swabs for testing, reagents to do testing um, are in, uh, you know, in terribly short supply. And, um, and, and it's for that reason that um, groups have been prioritized for testing when the testing is available. Again, whether they be healthcare personnel um, or they be um, those individuals that are admitted to the hospital because the testing then helps inform what kind of uh, infection prevention measures need to be taken by healthcare personnel caring for those patients in the hospital. Also, you know, for those in, in our essential uh, emergency services. So how has it affected our ability to fight this uh, on a national level? We're not just talking to CAB now. On a broader level, uh, you know, our, it, it sounds like from what, what we're hearing from uh, the news and even from the White House news conferences every day that we're kind of behind the eight ball here. So we're seeing uh, numbers increase exponentially every day. Uh, every couple of days uh, around the country and in uh, communities like DeKalb, like states like Georgia. Uh, but, you know, we are still behind the eight ball. We're looking at the, the disaster that's happening in Italy. Uh, prepare us for what's to come next before we find ourselves on the downslope. Well, I, I think you're, you're on, on target. I mean, not having readily available testing makes it, makes it more difficult. The thing that it makes most difficult is having an understanding about how widespread COVID-19 um, is in our community. And it's hard to tell if you, don't, if you don't have tests. You don't know how many people have it. it it's hard to tell. I mean, because you know, not everyone with a sore throat and cough uh, you know, has COVID-19. I mean, we're going into allergy season now. You know, not, not everyone with a fever has COVID-19. Um, and so it does, it does make it more difficult. Um, you know, from a, a public health perspective, and I'm grateful that we have public health professionals in the room, um, I'm a clinician. Um, from a public health perspective, understanding uh, the uh, prevalence of disease in the community um, is, is important to understand when you get to that peak and, and you know, when you start to, to kind of come back down off of that peak. Now, what I will say, though, is that if you have mild, mild signs and symptoms of illness, let's say of COVID-19, if you have fever, if you have some, um, some cough, if you have some mild difficulty breathing, if you're otherwise you know, a person that doesn't have medical problems and you are otherwise able to eat and drink and kind of get along, but you're ill, just like when you feel like you, know, you get the flu during a seasonal flu outbreak. Um, 
It would be nice for you to, as an individual to know that you have COVID-19, but frankly, it wouldn't much change how you're managed. If you have mild signs and symptoms of the illness, you'd still be advised to go home, to isolate yourself from others, to try and stay away uh, you know, from other people who are still well, um, to in your home, you know, have a private bathroom if that's possible. When do you make that call to the doctor? Um, I think, you know, I think people that have an illness that develop a fever or a cough um, that have access to making a call to a doctor, it's always advisable. And when you say fever, how, how high a fever? Well, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of clinicians will use 100.5 as, as a, uh, a benchmark. But I think you know, as, as we learn more about the presentation of COVID-19, um, there's no one that would tell you that you must have a fever of 100.5 to be ultimately proven to have COVID-19. So you can just, you know, be feverish. You could have chills. You could have a documented fever. People, I think, know when they're ill. Right. I mean, in my, in my view, and as a clinician, people know when they don't feel well. And if you if you're not feeling well, if you develop a fever, if you start to develop a cough, um, it is reasonable if you have a, a physician to give them a call and ask them, you know, what what you think they should do, right, or uh, what they think you should do. I think that's very reasonable. I think we also have to expect that call lines might be tremendously overloaded. It's also possible that it might be more difficult to access your physician you know, when there's tremendous demand for resources. And that will also be true in the emergency departments. But um, uh, you know, people, I think, have an understanding about when they're not feeling well. Um, I would say nothing that should interrupt a, a, a person's relationship with their physician. And I wouldn't do anything that would dissuade them from calling their doctor to get some advice. So very quickly before we go on, because I have so many more questions for our next uh, expert coming up in, in public health, which you have referenced. But before we move on, uh, just recently, we, as of yesterday, we are hearing that new statistics that the CDC is gathering from China and other places indicate that more than a third of the hospitalizations from this virus are among young people. Now, all along, we've heard that the, those at highest risk are 60 and above, the most severe, 80 and above. But now we're hearing that 30 to nearly 40 percent of those severe cases that require hospitalization involves young people between 18 and, and 52. So that said, how do we get millennials and, and young people to observe the social distancing and all in the hunkering down at home and not shaking hands and all of the things that, that we've been told to do. They're not doing it. All you have to do is go to the beach in Florida and see that they're, they're no, still partying there. So Absolutely. how do you get them to, to you know, change their minds and actually comply? Well, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you raised that point. Um, it's, uh, and, and for the very reason that you mentioned it. Uh, so first of all, yes, you know, every day we're going to see some new information from CDC that's shared that better informs us about this outbreak. And, and the information that you just shared is, is, you know, something just like that. The, you know, the, the seniors in our community, those over 80, those over 65, they're still at, at greatest risk for having the most serious consequences from this illness. And we have to do what we can, you know, to protect them from getting ill. This group that you just mentioned that, uh, um, that still is at risk for being hospitalized, I think that should be um, you know, a wake-up call for those that are in their 20s that think that they're completely immune from having any serious consequences from this, this illness. And, um, and so that is, again, it's a clarion call for me that even young people um, have to uh, do what they can to, to participate in the social distancing that's being recommended you know, for us across the board, because they can spread it from one another, Many of them can get ill enough to go to the hospital. And we know that if they're also engaging with their family members that might have underlying medical problems, lung problems, heart problems, diabetes, they're putting them at risk. Their right. grandparents, they're putting them at risk. Um, and so you're right, this uh, social distancing piece is not just for people older than 65, it's for everybody. And uh, you're bringing up the point that, that there's a high rate of hospitalization in that age demographic too. Even if most of them ultimately are discharged well from the hospital, um, it's, a, it's a real concern people should implement social distancing and try to stay well. We, we all should act as if we are carrying the disease so that we can, you know, 
we can decide how we behave and we can protect each other. How you behave affects me, how I behave affects you. All right, Dr. Isakoff, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, we wanna move on now to our, uh, our next presenter and expert in public health, Dr. Elizabeth Ford has served as the District Health Director and Chief Executive Officer of the DeKalb County Board of Health since February 2005. She's also serving as the Interim District Health Director of Fulton County Board of Health. So Dr. Ford, thank you very much. And we are anxious to hear what you have to say about public health policies in this time of crisis. Thank you, and thank you to Mr. CEO for yet again giving me an opportunity to um, provide some information um, in a safe environment and also try to hopefully calm down some anxiety. So a lot has happened since we last were together <laughs> in terms of numbers. Um, when we were here previously, was that just a week ago? Gosh, okay, so last week we had a handful of states um, and about four or 5,000 cases nationwide. Now we are up to more than 10,000 cases in the United States, and every single state has a case of COVID-19. In addition, we have the District of Columbia, Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and um, Puerto Rico. So everybody is being hit now with COVID-19. I'm happy that we finally got the COVID-19 piece straight and the difference between regular coronavirus and COVID-19. So let me talk about what's going on in Georgia. Um, on the 18th, we had 182 cases in Georgia. Today, we have 287. So this is growing exponentially. We have 10 deaths right now. Um, DeKalb County has 22 cases currently, up from 14 just a few days ago. DeKalb has 8% of the cases in the state of Georgia. We are number four. Um, the um, spread we talked about before, so I won't go into that too much, except to say that, as I mentioned the first time, this is a novel virus. And so every time we open up a book or listen to an, a report, we learn something new. And so we understand that this is a droplet spread infection. However, what we're learning is that it lives on surfaces much longer than we initially thought. And so Ms. Wood has the right idea with her Clorox wipes keeping her area <laughs> clean because because that's going to be more and more important because um, they're saying that this virus can live up on up to days in some instances, depending on the type of surface. And so that that's very much worrisome to us. Um, who is at risk? That same risk group, yes, over 60, diabetics, hypertension, also pregnant women, and anyone else whose immune system is compromised. I do want to say about our youth, um, as a pediatrician, yes, our kids think they're invincible. But here's the thing. Um, our, our teenagers may be asymptomatic carriers. So what that means is they may not feel bad, but they may still be carrying the virus and pass it on to someone whose immune system is vulnerable and make them sicker. And that's why we are encouraging. I prefer to call it physical distancing because what we're trying to encourage actually is a social connection. So we're encouraging social media for folks who are quarantined. Um, everyone, this is what day, everyone has cabin fever like nothing I've ever seen. And so we're encouraging people to, reach out and connect with each other in other ways. So I prefer to use the phrase physical distancing um, to, to um, express what we're looking for. Um, what I want to talk about, most importantly, um, we talked about how to manage this. And right now, um, of course, unless you need to be hospitalized, this is all symptomatic management. But I do want to say that the latest information is strongly discouraging the use of ibuprofen and other anti-inflammatories. So mm. when we tell you, you know, take fever reducers, I'm not talking about ibuprofen. There have been studies that have shown that ibuprofen seems to worsen the course of COVID-19. So right now it is recommended that you try to find other um, pain relievers or fever reducers. Um, I also heard, um, we, we're doing a lot of um, old school remedies now as well. And elderberry is another one of those things I've heard thrown through the air. And that's another thing that also happens to um, worsen the symptoms of COVID-19 by report. And so that's another thing we would not be recommending. Um, since we talked about testing, I, I want to talk about that because that's been a, a hot topic um, throughout the state for a while now. 
Georgia has never had adequate amount of testing because we just, you know, we weren't sure what we needed. And so we have been provided a limited number of tests all along. Um, we are currently, we just received a, lar a reasonable number of tests from the state, but they will be distributed to all 18 public health districts. So it still will not be um, enough from the state. But we have other commercial labs that we can test and send um, specimens to. I want to talk a little bit about what's happening currently as it relates to specimen collection, because um, it was very troubling to me to see on the news that our sites that are designated for doing specimen collection um, are being outed. Those are supposed to be confidential sites. And that reason for that is, number one, to protect the privacy of the individuals who are coming to get their samples taken, but also because we're painfully aware that we don't have a number of tests. And so what we don't want is people just walking up and demanding a test. And so these are supposed to be private, secret places. And there's not because we're trying to be sneaky. It's because we're trying to present, prevent and protect the privacy of folks who are getting tested. And so when our sites are leaked and, and cameras come up, that, that's, a, that's a violation. And so we will continue to try to protect the privacy of individuals who are being tested for COVID-19 in any way we can. So who is getting tested right now? The first group of tests that come to us are through our private providers. A individual will go to their doc. Um, they will be evaluated if their physician determines that they have a level of symptom um, adequate enough to require testing. They will make a call to the health department. And we will, we will collect the data from that individual, and they will be provided with a special number. We call it a PUI number. PUI stands for Person Under Investigation. That PUI number is their sort of golden ticket to a test um, or a specimen collection. Let me say that. We are not doing testing. We are collecting specimens that then go to our private labs. So an individual with a PUI number will report to the undisclosed site, a specimen will be collected and sent either to the Georgia Public Health Lab or private lab. Um, in addition to physician-referred patients, we are also making special um, concessions, as Dr. Isikoff mentioned, for our first responders and for other individuals who care for those who are uh, medically fragile. For example, workers who care for um, individuals who are in senior citizen homes or some of the other high-risk areas that we've already mentioned. Again, because of the limited number of tests or even test collection that we have available, we're just not going to be able to see everyone. And so this has to be a, a reasonable process that has some level of control at this point. Now, you're going to see your numbers of positive results increase as we test. When you look, you find. And so don't be d alarmed when you see numbers double by Monday because we have much more um, ability to test. And as we test more, we will find more positives. And that's what we want to do, because when we find positives, then we can isolate them appropriately and keep them away from the rest of the public. Um, we are still working to try to identify um, partnerships with labs um, so that we can perform more tests. But I don't believe there will ever be a time when every single individual who wants to be tested is tested. Because as Dr. Isikoff said, if your symptoms are mild, um, then it, it would not be appropriate for you to be tested at this point. Um, we are asking everyone, if you are symptomatic, to behave as if you were positive and separate yourself from the community. Um, and sometimes your own family members, and to continue with the same precautions that we discussed last week, frequent hand washing, cleaning of surfaces even more vigorously now than when we have mentioned last week, covering your cough, and the, the critical one, which a lot of in, um, organizations seem to have already addressed, is not coming to work when you're sick and not coming to school when you're sick. And so I think that the schools being closed will give us an opportunity to move forward in allowing this disease to subside um, to some extent, but um, 
we will still need to be mindful and vigilant of folks who are symptomatic, folks who have been exposed, and make sure that this distancing continues until that peak that you speak of manifests itself. All right, so several questions, lots of questions, and we're <laughs> going to get some more at the end of our program as well uh, from, from our audience. But let's, let's start here. Uh, do we have drive-through testing here in DeKalb County? If so, where and how many? So, as I just mentioned, yes, we have drive-through tests. We have specimen collection. Let me be Is, clear. That's different from drive-through testing? Yes, because we're just collecting the specimens. The specimens still have to be sent to a lab. How do you get the specimen? It's a nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, yes, so I know. Very but unpleasant. The, the, yes. Yes, I hear it's very unpleasant. <laughs> yes. uh, Nothing but nice but about that, that means that the person who is ill has to go to a doctor or to an emergency room yes, to get that. that they have to have that PUI number that they would receive from their physician, and then um, they notify the health department that the, the, the physician would say, I'm sending you a client. We collect that information. We tell the, the patient where the site is, which is undisclosed at this point because we do have such a limited number of tests. So that is not something that would be widely advertised because we can't have 500 people showing up sure. requesting a I test. I understand. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some who would argue, though, that we need universal testing so Absolutely. that we know where to serve resources. But we don't have enough test kits for that. Absolutely. But back to drive through. So yes. th that's something different. Yes. Is there drive-through testing like what we've seen uh, happening in New, Roche New Rochelle, New York, what we've seen even in South Korea? Uh, is there drive-through testing here in DeKalb County? Yes, it just started today, though. Okay. And how are you getting the word out? Can you tell us where that is? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People have to get the information yes, from their doctor. Yes, you have to have been referred by your physician. Okay. And that makes sense because we're seeing uh, cars wrapped right. around blocks yeah, and blocks would, in, in New York and other places where they're doing this. And we have a very this. limited number of tests. Uh, how effective, it, there is an urgency now and a call for self-swabbing. Uh, to, to, to do some testing, just to make things go faster. Um, is that effective? Is that something you would like to see happen here? I, I didn't even know that was an uh, for, Well, if you've ever tried to do your own nasopharyngeal swab, I'm, that, not that sure, terrible. I'm not sure that would that would work. Also, it's a chain of command issue. Um, the, the current tests that we do are in a special medium um, that goes direct. The, the lab has their own specific medium that they request. So that's one lab. The ones that are going to the Georgia Public Health Lab, they have to be on ice. So there's a chain of command that has to be in place for you to just you know, send them out. So at this point, I'm sure that as we move forward with this, more technology will come in. We'll be able to do things like that. But a nasopharyngeal swab is not an easy thing to collect. Right. Uh, how long to get the results? Um, anywhere between 24 and 48 hours. So we are getting a better turnover, turnaround now. The initial batch of testing that was done in the state of Georgia all had to be confirmed by the CDC. And that was really, you know, delaying um, results because obviously all, everyone in the nation is sending them all to the same lab. We have since been able to to do the testing at Georgia Public Health Lab and at our commercial testing sites without having to have that additional verification by CDC. And how do people get the information? How do they get the results? Do they have to go online or do they get a phone call? They would get a phone call. All right. You mentioned the CDC. I have to wonder, the fact that the CDC is in DeKalb County's <laughs> own backyard, I mean, does that give you an advantage at all in handling this crisis? I have tried. <laughs> no. Um, and, it, and it wouldn't be fair. But no, we, we are in the same queue as everyone else and that was part of the issue with the testing was you know we're, we're waiting with everyone else and there was a perception that there you, I could literally walk down the street and hand you these tests but it doesn't work like that we, so the fact that we no longer have to do that is definitely speeding up our, our ability to get results faster. Right. We're, we're, are you do you expect to get any more test kits? Yes. In, in greater numbers? Well, we have the ones that are coming from the state, but we can also utilize private labs. It's just, you know, at an expense. So we're, you know, it depends on the resources available to the counties. That's a question for the CEO. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, so many more questions, because I want to ask you, talk to you some about hospital preparedness as well, uh, personal protective gear for our, our frontline medical staff. Uh, but we have uh, some more uh, experts here in the room sure. that we want to hear from uh, before we get to all of that. So thank you very much, Dr. Ford. Uh, as we continue, Ramona Tyson uh, was appointed the interim superintendent of the DeKalb County uh, Schools District, effective November 2019. Ms. Tyson previously served the district for 32 years as a classroom teacher. 
I mean, she's already a hero in our community, an administrator, deputy chief superintendent, interim superintendent, chief of staff to three superintendents, chief administrator to the Board of Education. Ramona Tyson, we are very, very fortunate to have you in the room with us. Please uh, tell us from your perspective and from your expertise and your knowledge, what is happening with our schools and our dear children. And thank you, Ms. Woods. CEO Thurman, I would like to thank you again for allowing the DeKalb County School District to participate in this forum. It's so important, and it gives us a platform to speak to over 100,000 parents and 15,000 employees that make up um, the school district. And while we do not have the opportunity to call our people first responders, there are some on-site responders I would like to take the opportunity to thank. And we are teleworking from home, but what I want the public to know that there is a cadre of employees that are showing up every day, exercising Dr. Ford physical distancing, and also ensuring that they are not coming to work sick with flu-like symptoms and a fever. But I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our food service workers, our bus drivers, our bus mechanics, our custodians, our plan engineers, our maintenance workers, our warehouse workers, our SROs who are patrolling our buildings 24-7 while we, we are teleworking, our payroll staff to make sure everybody gets the check on the 1st and the 15th, our accounting staff that's ensuring all of our payables are done, and even um, the executive team that is working around the clock with me over 15 hours a day to make sure we are providing the services that we need. And I would be remiss not to thank my Board of Education for what they're doing to support me because they understand I'm having to make some swift, hard decisions and they're giving me the runway to do that. So I'd like to thank them. With that being said, I would like to talk a few points about the things that the school district is doing to serve its parents, the students, and the employees. I would like to start first with a little quick video on digital learning days. And this is, this is uncharted territory for this period of time. And so with this quick video, I want you to see this and then we'll come back and share some more information. school closure, the district will institute digital learning days. Teachers will provide students with a virtual learning assignment that is content specific and relevant. Each assignment will be aligned to the standards and what the students are currently learning. Here are some examples of what students might encounter on our Verge platform. In U.S. history, students see the standard and learning target and are then asked to analyze and respond to a political cartoon. Here's a mathematics example. We can see an eighth grade surface area lesson where students watch a brief video before completing some practice problems. In addition to these types of activities, students may be asked to read, conduct research, perform mini labs, or take notes. Verge allows teachers to provide engaging standards-based learning experiences. Thank you. I hope you had the opportunity to see a very small, quick snapshot of what Digital Learning Days means in DeKalb County. Teachers and principals, assistant principals, are all implementing this strategy to ensure that our children's learning does not stop as we work behind virtual learning walls. We are no longer in brick and mortar walls, but we now are working within a virtual community. And I wanna thank our teachers for everything that they're doing to ensure that our students will continue with the content 
as we work through this national crisis. I personally had an experience last night with my two teenagers, and so I want to thank my parents who have become teachers <laughs> um, overnight. <laughs> and we are hearing from you. I'm hearing everything from teachers need a raise, mm -hmm. teachers need more money. I had no idea. <laughs> and so parents, we thank you for seeing the reality of what our 7,000 teachers do every day. And we thank you for being the frontline teacher to assist our teachers as they take our students through this process. I want to also share with you that our meal service program is, is well underway. We are within the first week of meeting our children where they are and ensuring that they get the grab and go meals that they so much need as we are closed um, in the building. And we have 21 sites that are serving as meal sites for lunch. And in partnership with the Cap County government, Mr. CEO, thank you again. We have nine recreational centers that are providing afternoon snacks for our children as well. And so we're within our first week of operation this week. We've served uh, thousands of meals to our students this week. And as we go into next week, I want to share with you that we're going to be using our buses to put on the bus route so we can go into neighborhoods, we can go into apartment complexes, and we can take the meals to the door of the children. The Atlanta Food Bank will join us next week on uh, March 23rd, and we'll be bringing food to our food sites to assist us as a partner. We want to thank them. Uh, for what they're doing. And then I would be remiss if I did not thank the local municipalities and the community advocates and the churches that are also rising to the occasion. It's taking a lot of partnerships to get this done and it's taking a village because what most people don't understand is in the, li understand in the lives of some children, sometimes that, that school lunch is the best meal they get for the day. And so uh, we are meeting that challenge. We're working hard every day. Again, the food service workers and the bus drivers, thank you for the work that you're doing. I want the parents to also know that while we are uh, first week of closure, we are cleaning buildings. We're in our buildings. We are sanitizing our buildings. We're using cleaning uh, materials from the CDC list, and we're taking a first uh, run in every school getting it clean and then at some point where there's a re-entry back into the school Three days before we go back into that building We're going to go back in again and we're going to clean those buildings a second round We are also we've cleaned over a thousand buses again from the list of CDC materials Those buses have been cleaned, and again before we do a re-entry We'll go back into those buses and we will clean them once more I do want parents, if they have not heard, the Georgia DOE has canceled the testing for this year for the Georgia milestones. And if you have not heard that officially, I want to reiterate that this evening, that we will not be doing the testing this year for Georgia milestones. And on March 26th, Superintendent, State Superintendent Richard Woods would be taking a waiver to the State Board of Education to ask them to waive the EOC requirement for high school students in the content areas where 20% of their grade counts for that EOC. And so if that vote is successful, then that's going to recalibrate um, for our high school students uh, the EOC requirement. And then um, lastly, I want to um, let you know that while we are teleworking, we are continuing with the work to ensure that our operations are still running for our school district. So at the point where we reopen, we have not missed any ground on anything in any aspect of the 18 divisions that make up the school district. People are working, and in fact, I've had several people to tell me I think I'm working a little harder than I was when I was sitting in the building. That's just fine with me. And so um, I want to assure you that you have a strong engine, a strong um, team concept where we're working hard for our employees, for our students and our families, and we look forward to continuing to serve you during this time. Thank you so much. Quick question here. Technology is a, is a wonderful thing because it does allow the school districts to get through this with online learning. But as you also know, there is such inequality when it comes to our students and their ability to
to have resources and access to resources, uh, depending on where they live, unfortunately. So there are kids who uh, don't have access to computers or the internet readily available to them. What, talk to me some about that. Uh, how do we address that so that those children don't fall behind? Thank you. In this world of digital learning, there is a digital divide. What I can tell you for DeKalb County students, for every child grade six through 12, uh, the school district has given every child grade six through 12 a Chromebook. And so we have those students that have that device that they have with them. They have the software platform where all the tools are already loaded. And then for our younger scholars, what we have done before is that we've been a, a, been able to give them the hard copy documents so that they have access to those for their digital learning or digital learning days, I should say. We will continue to chop away at the digital divide. Uh, we've done a great job of putting out hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars into the millions for grade, sixth graders through 12th graders, and we have more work to do. So. Uh, we will continue to work with our Board of Education, with our providers to make sure that we continue to close that gap. Yeah, I tell you what, uh, when all of these parents are now discovering that they are having to be teachers at home, <laughs> it, is a, it is a new and scary world on that level, I'm sure, because it requires a lot of structure. Uh, in the in the home. And so maybe we can circle back a little bit later and talk some more about that if you have any tips or if they can go, parents can go any, somewhere online to, uh, to uh, learn how to have more structure and to get some things accomplished during the course of the day. Uh, Superintendent Ramona Tyson, thank you very much. We move on to our, our last uh, panelist here, Mayor Patty Garrett. Patty Garrett was elected to the City Commission in 2009 and as Mayor Pro Temp in 2015. She has been active in the community since moving to Decatur in 2001. No question, it is at the center and the core of your heart. Thank you for all the work that you do. Mayor Patty Garrett. Thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you to uh, the CEO for including me this evening. Um, I'm here representing the DeKalb Municipal Association, and that is an organization of elected officials in the cities that are located um, ex exclusively in DeKalb County. And that includes, and I don't want to leave anybody out, so um, Avondale, Brookhaven, Shambly, Clarkston, Decatur, Doraville, Dunwoody, Lithonia, Pine Lake, Stone Mountain, Stonecrest, and Tucker. And I think it's important for um, me to point out that the actions of people taken in cities where our densest populations are, are really important and critical to what is, is happening with the spread. And I like Dr. Ford's definition of using physical distancing. I heard uh, social distancing being defined today by Dr. Car Carlos Del Rio from Emory as to sprint to sprint prevent the community spread, spread the community. Mm -hmm. And I've been heartened to see um, posts on social media where there have been groups of teenagers out and a parent will go out with a, um, with a measuring tape and show them what six feet looks like so um, that we can get maybe some of the, the younger people to, uh, to fully participate in the seriousness of making sure that we keep that physical distance. Um, I think one of the things that I also want to say is how much I appreciate our Georgia Municipal League. They have put us as um, mayors together in contact with a number of resources, both at the, the federal, state, and um, at even the metro-wide level and with working with our county. We've had phone calls with the Metro Atlanta Mayors Association. It's important for us to know what is happening in the metro region as a whole and how we can um, um, best respond. And I think as everybody knows, the um, really the public health decisions that are being made right now are being made uh, primarily We've been tasked to do this at the local level and um, that uh, with respect to um, implementing any kind of emergency measures and that sort of thing, a number of the cities in DeKalb County, including the city of Decatur, did pass legislation to give the mayor um, emergency powers in a public health crisis. And, um, 
a number of other cities in the uh, DeKalb County have done the same thing. Um, due to this, this ability for cities to decide for themselves, some cities have taken different tax, even in the um, county. The cities of uh, Brookhaven, Dunwoody, Clarkston, and Decatur have now all implemented some sort of restaurant closure policies. I signed an emergency order this afternoon uh, restricting it to um, curbside or takeout only for the restaurants in the city of Decatur. Uh, those other restaurants have done, um, done similar. We also restricted gatherings of uh, no more than 50 people following some of the same legislation that Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms did today as part of her executive order. I also want to ensure, as the CEO has done, that um, our residents know that the local government is there to serve them. Many of us have um, closed our city halls and um, have people working maybe different shifts and also uh, certainly keeping social distancing, wiping down surfaces and that sort of thing. Uh, but that our sanitation poli police and fire are, um, are functioning normally. We are out there to serve the public and that those services, we are doing everything we can to maintain uh, good services within our cities as is the county and appreciate our partners at the county level for um, the quality of services that they provide. And of course, our water and sewer in every city comes from DeKalb County and very much um, appreciate the, the hard work and the diligence that the county is doing with those services. So um, it's an honor to be here to represent the city of DeKalb County, and I'm happy to also um, answer any questions. But the cities are doing their part in this and um, encouraging people to be, take this seriously and to enjoy uh, being outside and enjoy doing things that um, you might not otherwise take the time to do, but to do them at a, a safe distance and to respect the guidelines that are out there. And I really appreciate the, the two physicians that are here today to, um, to really focus on and help us know exactly what those good guidelines are. So thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions here okay. when you talk about social distance, physical distancing uh, and, and keeping a safe distance. What about our emergency personnel and our police and firefighters? Should they have protective gear when they go out to work? And, you know, is that is that possible? Is that in the budget? Is that something that Decatur can provide? Well, one of the things, as was shown, I think, in the video that is extremely helpful to all emergency personnel is if there is a 911 call that you let the 911 service know why you're calling. And if you suspect that, that you are running a fever and you need emergency services um, or ambulance services that our police and fire know that when they get there so that they are fully prepared and to put on uh, protective gear. So um, at, at this point, we are, um, I mean, we we have we have gear available that that is for our emergency responders. I don't know that um, uh, we're we're. We are as prepared as we think we can be. We have an emergency response team that meets every morning in the city of Decatur, but I don't think we have gone to, you know, you're not going to go by the police or fire station and see everyone. That, right, sure. That's, that's it, not... They, they that, encounter right. so many people all right, the time. all the time. You know, it's all spontaneous, the time, so, so they're not necessarily getting right. a call for every call, every uh, uh, incident that they right. handle. So uh, that that is a thought, and you're right. I mean, whatever precautions we all take, we feel like we could take more. We need to take more uh, because this virus is so prevalent. Uh, one other question here. You know, there's Decatur has one set of rules. Sandy Springs may have another set of rules. Powder Springs, another. Austell, all of these different cities have their own guidelines to go by. It's sort of a patchwork 
uh, in the state of Georgia, and Georgia is not unique. This is everywhere. Everybody's making their own decisions I I individually. Uh, do, do, talk to me some about that. Your thoughts. Uh, do we need to have a more uniformed approach when it comes to, from city to city? Comes to city to city to city, or do you prefer to have this sort of individualistic approach? Well. We've been asked that question and we've asked it ourselves as well. I think an ad hoc approach um, preserves the rights of what we call home rule for cities. Um, I do think that in a case like this, that um, by having the city of Atlanta take the measures that they did, it was very helpful for us as if, if we're the only city that does that and we're surrounded by areas that have not made those changes, then um, I, we were, and that's one reason we waited for a little while is because if we were the only city that did make those changes, how effective was that going to be? Was it just going to push crowds to other places? And, um, mm -hmm. but I think, um, you know, Every city currently has the right to make that decision. I think there, we were all on a phone call today where we were really urged for cities to take action at least for 15 days to try to do what we can to slow down the spread and to be um, more aggressive to be there, there are lots of calls for states everywhere to, right, be, more to be more aggressive and and I can't think of any it, what's more aggressive aggressive at this point I think is sort of a national quarantine uh, a complete lockdown like what we see in Italy is that something that you would like to see Georgia do be more aggressive and and try to you know really really get ahead of the curve on this I I think a, a, a quarantine is uh, would would be a major step that would come from uh, public health recommendations, and uh, I, I the governor has made it clear that at this point he is not going to um, have a statewide blanket of uh, certain regulations. So I think it is that's up to each area, and that is um, that is the guidance that we have right now, and I think that. Um, I, I'm hoping that there may be some additional communities. Th to be honest, the city of Decatur first sent out a letter and said, we hope that you will voluntarily do this as a community to close down in-house dining and to take out. And many of our restaurants had already started doing that, um, but not all of them. And we just felt like there were still groups gathering in restaurants and um, on restaurant property, and that it was, um, and that was why the decision was made that we needed to uh, protect our restaurant workers as well as protect, do what we could to have that physical distance and to um, ensure that it was happening sort of uniformly, at least now throughout our community. And I would imagine that the more and more people are complying. Uh, with with the ask to volunteer to uh, to stay in to volunteer to close their businesses as they see the number of cases go up 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 right uh, and I, we did have a number of uh, restaurants that had already started and we were tracking those um, but we decided that if for it to be uniformly applied that we needed to take action All right all right Patty Garrett thank you very thank much you. we're going to open this up now to questions from our viewers out there. Uh, thank you again for uh, joining us on the DeKalb County Government Line, uh, online, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Uh, this is something that uh, is a benefit to all of us as we try to traverse this crisis and get through it together and make smart decisions from good information. So thank you very much for joining us. We're taking your questions. Lakeitha Carlos, who is the CEO for us, uh, the chief of staff of our CEO, is uh, online looking at your questions, uh, funneling those questions to me. And so please feel free to uh, to send her your questions. And Lakeitha, when you have some, just raise your hand, let me know so, so that we can go to you. I already have some in hand, so let's get started with our town hall questions from our audience. Why shouldn't people who have N95 masks wear them in order to avoid virus infection since medical personnel everywhere use them? If they don't help keep uninfected people from getting the virus, why do healthcare workers wear them? So I'm gonna direct that question to Dr. Ford. 
Oh, okay. Well, uh, I, I will take Dr. Isakoff then. Sure. I'll, take a, I'll take a crack at that. So, so the way this virus is transmitted is primarily through large droplet, meaning when you, if you coughed into somebody's face and those droplets got in their nose and mouth, that would be the, the, the primary way by which it's transmitted. So these N95 respirators, they're very special respirators. They're different than a simple face mask. They're used by healthcare personnel because healthcare personnel are actually around sick patients in the hospital that are getting procedures that um, increase, let's say, these very, very tiny droplet nuclei or aerosols um, that the N95 respirator protects you from. So a patient that might need to be put on a ventilator needs to have a breathing tube placed. That is a, a um, aerosol producing procedure. Other types of ways to support somebody's ventilation, people that can't breathe on their, an, their own anymore and need some mechanical support, these are aerosol producing procedures. And so the, the people that are at risk, greatest risk, for infectious aerosols or the healthcare personnel that are caring for these patients in the hospital, they're the ones in dire need of these N95 respirators. And, um, and, and as we know, there's a shortage of them in the community yes. um, all over the country, actually, not just here in Metro Atlanta. And so uh, preserving those N95 respirators um, for those healthcare personnel who are in dire need of them, including the emergency responders that are going out in the field to do some of these procedures, is really paramount. And that's why N95 respirators are reserved for healthcare personnel, um, and it's uh, you know different than what people would do in the community. It should, is it okay, and is it beneficial for people? We see that just sort of the, the the paper masks. I'm sure it's a little bit more than paper, but you know the very simple masks are, are they helpful? So a simple, should we all be wearing those? A simple face mask or uh, or a surgical mask? Um, no, we shouldn't all be wearing them. I'll tell you who should absolutely be wearing them if they have to go out. It's people with a fever and cough. So, you know, clearly what we advise people, if you're sick, if you have a fever, you have a cough, um, you should stay home, right? Um, and do everything that you can to just stay at home and not be in contact with people that are otherwise well. Um, but some people just can't do that. They, if they have to go get food, because no one, they don't have a neighbor, they don't have a family or friend um, that, can, that, that can bring them the food, they have to go get food. So if that's the case, then if you're sick and you need to go out in the community, you should be wearing a surgical, you or a, you know, a, um, a surgical mask. Very difficult question. They are also in short supply. And I think anybody that's uh, you know, listening or in this room knows that if you go to any of the local phar uh, pharmacies and you were looking for them, I mean, that is an empty shelf. Yeah, right it's now. hand sanitizer and difficult. toilet paper, same yep, thing. that's right. <laughs> same that's category. Right. <laughs> That's right. right. But you know, but but part of that, I think, is because um, uh, one, okay, there's not a great enough supply of them. I mean, because this outbreak occurred in China and there was so such great demand for this type of personal protective equipment in China. I mean, a good part of our supply chain uh, and and the origin of a lot of the, of those masks. They're from China, and so they needed them. They weren't shipping them. Now we have, you know, great need for them here in the United States, and um, and our supply chains are trying to catch up. Some people um, are, you know, hoard, bought them and hoarded them because they felt there was a need to wear them, you know, walking around even though they're well. And and where I can understand, you know, I can understand their logic. Although if they're well, they really don't much benefit from wearing this, the. Uh, this you know simple mask, um, they they were off the shelves, and the people that really need them, the ones that are sick, right. um, they you know them. need to have yeah they right. can't get them. Well, God yeah. bless you if you have uh, those masks, especially if uh, you are coughing or have some illness, uh, and if you don't, well, hence the directive: stay at least six feet away from the person you're talking to. Our next question, uh, well, I'm going to go to Lakeitha right now. We have a question online. Thank you, Brenda. Online, we have had someone ask, if someone in my household were to be exposed or to get symptoms of the coronavirus, how should we quarantine in the house with someone who could potentially have it? Dr. Ford? So that's a challenge. Um, so if you are exposed and you are symptomatic, then you need to isolate, not quarantine. And it's just a definition difference. Quarantine folks do not have symptoms. So if you are symptomatic, it's a challenge. It really depends on the size of your house. Mm -hmm. It's very hard, especially as a parent, to isolate because your children will follow you all over the house. Right, right, um, right. So, but, but, and how, how much isolation are we talking about? Just to a room or are we talking about you can't use the same utility? 
utensils or bath towel or you can't share other things? How deep does that go? What we're recommending, if possible, is that a person who is isolated needs to have a separate bathroom. Um, is that always a thing? Right. Not it's always a, yeah. possible. And so if that's not a thing, and which is not for most folks, then after they use the bathroom, it definitely needs to be disinfected pretty um, aggressively. Um, if you are in a household where you are symptomatic and the rest of your family is lucky enough to not be symptomatic, that's definitely when your mask comes in, your face mask, so that you can try to avoid... Um, spreading, I would make sure that um, utensils are, of course, washed in hot water. Um, towels should be exchanged every day. One thing that people don't think about is when you're sick, change your toothbrush out. That's another one of those things um, that you just keep reinfecting yourself if you keep brushing your teeth with the same toothbrush. So once you're once you're sick and you feel better, all that stuff needs to go. All right. Good, good information. The, online, the CDC is recommending if you don't have a face mask, uh, and especially recommending it to our uh, frontline medical personnel, use a bandana or scarf. I, I, it's hard to fathom that in the United States that is actually a recommendation from our, our, our top uh, health experts, and it's online, but we're desperate. Yeah, so, it gives a sense of how short we are with the Is equipment. that effective? Is that, I'm, good, I'm Any, asking you and Dr. Isakoff, is that effective? Anything that prevents droplet spread is effective. It's not maximal effective, but it's something. It's makeshift. Right. You do what you have to do. Right. All right, I have another question. Uh, I'm a 72-year-old retired person with no underlying medical conditions living alone. I've been social distancing by staying home most of the time. The question is, is there any real danger from going for a walk in nature with a friend if we walk with, uh, with some space between us on a not very crowded trail? So again, my, uh, the medical professionals here... I think they absolutely should get out of the house. I mean, I think that um, just being outside in fresh air does this 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 confinement is is nerve wracking. And I think as long as you have appropriate physical distance, you know, and it's not you think, keep in mind, though, it is allergy season. And so right. you may come back still sneezing and be mindful of that. But as long as you are maintaining adequate distance, I think a little fresh air is not a bad thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Isakoff. Uh, I agree with you 100 percent. All right. Our, a flyer was placed on our mailbox yesterday stating okay. that a new water meter will be installed at our home. No dates were given for this project to start. Will the new day project continue during this uncertain time or has it been temporarily put on hold? Uh, I don't know whether this came from DeKalb County Unincorporated or from one of our cities, so I don't know whether it's Decatur, or, but I'm going to direct this to our CEO. Uh, thank you. We are in the process of replacing 102,000 uh, water meters that were easily uh, manufactured with a potential defect or meters that are beyond their life cycle. Uh, the New Day project, uh, my most recent numbers suggest that we've already installed 30,000 meters, and this uh, installation will continue during this process. All right. That's something else to handle, and I'm sure it's it's like a house on fire every single day and here at the DeKalb County office, right, having to deal with the crisis and also this project. But ultimately, it's going to tremendously improve the quality of uh, registering water consumption, and we're replacing, in many instances, manual meters with meters that will actually uh, telephonically or at least uh, electronically submit or transmit water consumption right. data. So at the end of the day, we're going to have a first class uh, water meter system throughout the county. It's a three year project and we have just completed our first year. I want to say there's something reassuring about that and calming about that because that tells us that there is some business as usual continuing here at DeKalb County and life is not totally turned upside down for all the residents. All right, we go back to Lakeitha. Question for Superintendent Tyson. How are kids with 504 plans and IEPs being accommodated if schools close for the rest of the year? Due to the serious nature of the outbreak of COVID-19, the district will not be able to provide in-person instruction for our students with 504s and IEPs. But what we have done we have put in place through our virtual learning, digital learning days, the ability to teleconference, to have telephone calls with parents and students to discuss, review, and clarify 
assignments and tasks. Uh, we're using instruction and tutoring by phone and over the internet and daily checks via phone or email. And we also want to encourage our parents to reach out to their teacher or their case manager for concerns that they have may have regarding their students. Now, we will try to the greatest extent possible, given the limitations that we have, to ensure our children get what they need. But what we will do when we are back in school, we will reconvene the IEP in 504 teams to meet and to discuss each child and what we need to do to provide extended services to those children. So we recognize that while we are unable to have that person-to-person -person contact, we will be working with our parents during and after to ensure they get the services that they need. Ms. Tyson, if I, if I can, could you explain uh, what a 504 and an IEP <laughs> plan is? I mean, yes. you know, I, I was a superintendent, but I played one on TV, and I said, <laughs> anyway, help us understand just yes, briefly, sir. please. An IEP stands for Individualized Education Plan, and 504 is a federal allotment number that is given to um, students with disabilities. And so when a child is tested, and deemed to be um, an exceptional child, sometimes called special education services through federal law are required for that child's education. And so there are meetings that are held with a, a, a group of teachers and individuals from what we call our support services special education department to determine what is needed in order for this child to have a fair access to education. And those services might be tutoring, they may be um, extended day, it may be a paraprofessional with that child during testing, or, or, or any other services uh, that will help that child maximize their opportunity to learn. Well, as you know, in this time where we're exercising um, physical distancing, I think I like that better, um, we are unable to be able to provide that to the children during this digital learning. So what we're saying as we move forward, um, we understand that we will have to reconvene those teams if that child's services have been diminished during this time frame, and we will be working with those teams to come back together and extend whatever we need to, to, to meet every single opportunity for those children. Thank you. Next question, how can we find out about programs or organizations that we can go to for financial support for rent or utilities or food? I'm going to direct this to Mayor Garrett of Decatur. Of course, there are many other cities uh, in, in DeKalb County. But since you're here, what, what is happening in your city? One of the things that we are doing is um, we have some folks on our staff that are um, getting together and trying to figure out exactly what assistance, um, especially so, you know, our businesses and residents may need. And if there are, I, I know that I did receive an email that I passed along about someone who was concerned about an eviction, and um, it was in the the Cab County, and um, so I did pass that along to the uh, to the CEO's office. So um, I think that we will handle those as we as we get notified about those kinds of things. Whether or not we can uh, talk to various uh, landlords or or people that are um, a, you know that own those properties to see if at least in some way we can um, ask them to um, hold off on that and to work with the, the residents. You don't have the authority to, to mandate that? Um, I That's something I, I'm not aware of. I know I've been asked, you know, could we, can we mandate no evictions? Can we mandate no, like, booting in the city? That is generally something that is um, much beyond what I would do, although, again, this is a time where we have uh, more emergency powers. Um, but because we have a council manager form of government, that would be something that I would have to work with our city manager and our city attorney to see what role, if any, that we we could play as as a local government. So, and while I have the microphone, I'll ask answer one more thing that you ask about with respect to the ad hoc approach. Um, my preference would obviously be that 
every um, municipality and the in the metro area would have the same sort of um, uh, recommendations, a more uniform, more approach. uniform. But it is not something that I um, have the, the the power to enact. But I think it it would be um, it would be effective. I think some communities are are wanting to handle it in a way that they think may still be effective, but might not be the, the same approach. I'm going to turn things over to the CEO Thurman on, on both of these topics. One, you know, how, how can people and where can they go to find financial support for rent, for utilities, make sure their lights are not cut off, make sure they're not evicted. And, and the other is, you know, the patchwork of various cities within the county doing their own thing. Your thoughts on that, on those two things? Well, both are great questions. Uh, what we plan to do at our third town hall that I hope you will host again <laughs> uh, that will occur next week is to look more at the delivery of services. Uh, we focus on education and, of course, the medical side, which are very critical. But we want to do more in terms of services available. Bring We will have, uh, hopefully, representatives from the housing authority, uh, the state level, uh, through uh, subsidies uh, provided by the state. Uh, also, it's going to be important to uh, uh, get access to unemployment insurance benefits uh, through the state. That's federal legislation now making its way that will enhance uh, opportunities for laid-off workers to access unemployment insurance, as well as food stamps. Those are the type issues we're going to look at at our next town hall, bring in the experts who can help us better understand uh, how to approach it. Uh, on the issue of the uh, ad hoc approach, uh, I've been in contact with Mayor Garrett and his other uh, mayors uh, in the camp, and uh, we've had some discussions about how to proceed. Uh, it seems simple in and of itself, and the mayor, and I know she struggled with it up until she made her decision this afternoon. Uh, when you close restaurants, people lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact. And you have to make a very hard decision, difficult decision, because that is affecting a person's ability to buy food for themselves, to provide clothing and shelter for themselves and their families. So what part of the uh, thinking for me was waiting for the federal government to move to provide extended and more and that has expedited, happened now. and it's happening. So what, what is your thought? Because it, it looks like uh, now that uh, the, the president has signed that coronavirus uh, supplemental bill, that those who qualify will get a check of about $1,000 for, for two too. months. Yeah. I, is that enough in your estimation? Is, is that enough to help you better make decisions and your, your uh, various mayors to make decisions about closing rather than uh, keeping open businesses? Yeah, it's, it's better than nothing, let's just be clear. And the support, the leverage that's coming from the federal state level will help local leaders uh, manage the situation. Mayor Garrett said something that we should not overlook. By default or design or strategy, much of the management and responsibility for managing this crisis is falling on the shoulders of local governments, whether they're cities or counties. That's great. We're closer to the problem. The challenge is that different elected officials have different philosophies and strategies about how to address it. But we are going to be, as a county government, uh, more aggressive going forward than we have. The, our first responsibility were to ensure that we were in a position to provide the essential services necessary to keep the county functioning. How often are you in conversation with the governor on I've, this crisis? I've not spoken to him directly on this crisis. He had a conference call with local leaders at municipal and or county leaders earlier this week. I've spoken to people on his staff, and it's an ongoing conversation. This is a novel virus. It's a novel crisis. And therefore, I said to my leadership team, you know, one of the greatest vulnerabilities that you have when you're dealing with a novel crisis is experience. That often impedes your ability to be flexible and adaptable to the challenges that mm. you face. And uh, so we'll continue to evolve. Uh, we'll continue to learn. And I'm certain, uh, ultimately, we will overcome this particular crisis. We will get past it. Thank you very much. Another question. We go back to Lakeitha. Just want to remind
remind our viewers and listeners that we have about 10 minutes left with our phone lines open. You can call and send questions at 404 371 2400, and you can email us at townhall at dekabcountyga.gov. You can also find us on social media on Facebook at It's in DeKalb GA and on Twitter at It's in DeKalb. Okay, so thank you. Another question here from one of our viewers. How are people who test positive for COVID-19 being treated since currently, currently there is no cure? And I wanna expand that question to say, uh, once they get into the hospital, it, there is no cure, there's no vaccine. So what's happening in the hospital for those who have been diagnosed with the disease, with the virus? So you've probably heard this before. It's um the, the physicians, nurses, the teams provide what's called supportive therapy. And so right now there is no cure for the COVID-19 virus. And what that means is that um, all these health care professionals are supporting all your vital organs and, and systems so that your own immune system can clear the virus. That's basically what it means. So if, for example, your lungs are affected and you're not getting enough oxygen, you get, you know, supplemental oxygen. If um, you have some... Uh, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, you're getting dehydrated, you get IV fluids. Um, if uh, you're having severe difficulty breathing, um, such that you might even need uh, support from a ventilator or breathing machine, that's what's uh, provided. If you know, you're getting severely ill and you need to have what's called renal replacement therapy. Like, you know, the so you're managing, of some symptom, kind of you're managing symptoms. That's right. You're much. supporting, you know, vital organs. You're supporting the lungs. You're supporting the heart. You're supporting the kidneys. This is all supportive therapy. And the goal is um, to support all these vital organs while your immune system is clearing the virus. And um, when your immune system is, starts to do its job, you'll slowly get better. You won't require that kind of support. Right. And the hope is that you'll go back you to- You mentioned ventilators, and we've heard a lot about ventilators and how it is in, they are in short supply all across the country. So I'm, I'm turning to you, Dr. Ford. How, uh, do we have enough ventilators here? Do we have uh, uh, enough beds, hospital beds? How prepared uh, is DeKalb County? to handle this and speak specifically to the ventilator situation. Well, again, that's uh, a, a medical hospital question, but we, yeah, we are very much aware of the shortage of ventilators throughout Georgia um, and hospital beds. And that's why we're trying to spare beds for folks who are truly, truly ill. And so, you know, folks who can manage their symptoms out of the hospital really need to try to do so, so that we save our beds for our most critical patients. Dr. Isakoff. Can yeah, chime no, in on I, mean, that? I, I agree with that, you know, completely. Um, you know, cl clearly uh, all the health systems, yeah, Emory included, is doing what they need to do to make these beds available. I mean, they've canceled elective surgeries um, to make beds available, to preserve the personal protective equipment that they need. Uh, they're not doing any any elective complex surgeries that would right. require you to be on a ventilator. Which you know, makes today. absolute sense. It makes total you, sense. You mentioned personal protective equipment, though, yep. that is also in short supply. We talked about the, the masks. That's right. Uh, does, does that concern you here? And we're, we're, we're localizing everything here in this conversation. So does that concern you here in DeKalb County? Uh, because there are some statistics that say during the course of this, some 20 to 30, maybe as high as 40 percent of medical staff front line will themselves get ill. So oh, does it concern you at all? And if you could speak to that, that point that we're short on all those things that protect the people who are trying to protect us. Absolutely. No, I'm very concerned about that, not just for um, me and my colleagues here in, in DeKalb County and Metro Atlanta, but really all over the country. You're right. Uh, these, uh, this personal protective equipment is what's required for us to safely care for patients. Um, and the availability of... Uh, ICU beds and ventilators and just hospital beds to deal with a large number of patients um, that are going to be seeking care and needing medical care. Yeah, that's very concerning. Actually, that, that is another tremendously important reason for us to implement these uh, uh, physical distancing measures um, to, uh, to try and slow the spread of the disease. I have the greatest confidence in, in our health system's ability to take care of the sickest people. Um, Emory University Hospital, Emory Healthcare took care of patients with Ebola virus disease in 2014, 2015. They have uh, outstanding experts in infectious disease and critical care. Um, there is expertise in emergency services, hospital medicine, critical care, 
um, anesthesia, um, in, in the health systems all through Metro Atlanta. They know how to take care of sick people, but there's risk they'll get overwhelmed. So we've got to do uh, what you've you know, heard us talk about. And, and the vernacular is we've got to flatten the curve. We've got to slow the acceleration of this outbreak so that, yes, people are going to get sick and some of them will be severely ill, but we've got to manage this outbreak in a way where those people are getting sick and seeking those services in smaller numbers than if we did nothing and just let you know the number of people that need right. those services spike. A question Physical here. distancing, critically important. A question here from our viewer. How do we know what level of spread of COVID-19 is in our community? Oh, you know, that's an excellent question. And, and it goes back to, you know, testing for the purposes of understanding, you know, spread in the community. So uh, I think as Dr. Ford had mentioned, I mean, we have, we have test results, we have numbers in Georgia. Um, and as more testing kits and reagents to conduct the actual testing are, you know, become available and more and more people get tested, we'll have a clearer and clearer picture about how widespread COVID-19 is in our community here in, in Georgia and in other states in the US. But, um, but we shouldn't let the absence of that information uh, uh, prevent us from doing what we need to do, and that is physical distancing, um, trying to uh, decrease the spread of the illness. Uh, for people that are ill, um, seek medical care if you, you need to. Certainly consult with your physician. And then when they advise you to go home and, and isolate, as has been described already, to prevent others from getting ill, you know, follow those instructions. Everything we can do to s decrease the spread of the virus um, is going to help our health system uh, manage the people that need their services most. Another quick question here. Once you've had COVID-19, are you immune to the disease? Very quickly. This is a novel virus, and so we, we can't say that for sure. Um, it's just like the flu. You can get the flu several times in a single season, so different type of flu, but um, I, we don't know that yet, unless is new information. No, I, I, you know, I, it, is, it is an unknown. I can't give you a definitive answer. I think our expectation is that um, from pe for people that recover from the virus, that you'll have had some immune response to the virus. Um, the expectation or the hope is that for some period after you recover, you'll have some immunity from that virus. But it, the answer is not crystal clear, and, and we, we've got to look to uh, CDC and our other uh, research partners to help us get a better answer to that question. I have another question here that, you know, we're, we're, we've been talking about how long it's going to take, or we've heard in the news how long it's going to take to get a vaccine for this novel virus, and it could be a year, a year and a half or more, uh, though test, uh, some trials have begun, human trials have begun. Uh, but there is some talk today about a treatment option possibly out there for COVID-19 to, to lessen the severity of the symptoms. Uh, hydroxychloroquine. Yes. Can you talk to me about that? What, what do you know, and you know, do, you, do you have a lot of hope in that? I have hope for anything right now, but um, this is a, a, a drug apparently that they use for malaria. <laughs> yes, uh, hydroxychloroquine is actually used for malaria, and it's used to treat um, lupus actually. Um, so yes, there have been some studies that have shown that some improvement, and so I'm sure that we will be using it on folks um, to see whether it, it actually does some good. But right now, it's it's pretty much one of the few things we have in our armament to work with. So we're excited about that. All right. Another question we hear, we go to Lakita. Two questions for uh, Superintendent Tyson. The Verge application that students are using during digital learning for schoolwork has been experiencing technical difficulties. Will there be guidelines on grading or what will be the appropriate protocol for turning in assignments? And the second question is, what are the plans for graduation for the DeKalb School District? <laughs> Thank you. First, let me take the Verge question. Um, first of all, I want you to know that this is a very popular platform that is not only a national product, but it's an international product. So you can imagine that this is being used all around the United States, and it is being used over in other countries. And so the, the taxing on the product has caused um, for uh, the slowness and some technical problems because um, everybody's trying to hit that product from school districts from all over the United States. Now, with that said, I think we're experiencing the same thing with teleconferencing. I know I tried to launch one the other 
um, of the, the other day when we first went into telework on Monday and the phone lines were just jammed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let me say first, we have to have some patience with the fact that um, this is a very popular product that's being used all over. Secondly, um, I want to give you this number, but if you forget it, you can go to any school in DeKalb County's website, and this number is on all 137 schools' website. We have a help desk established for students and for parents, and it's 678-676-1180. Again, 678-676-1188. And if you do not have that number written down, again, go to any local school website and you'll see it published there. There's also an opportunity for you to email in. If you are a parent and you have a login to our Infinite Campus, which is our electronic grade book, you can get directly to your child's teacher and you can connect with that teacher and email into that teacher and tell that teacher you're experiencing a problem. The other thing I want to remind you is that this product is not our platform that we just created because we had to close the school district. We've been using this for over two years. And so whenever there's inclement weather, whether it's snow or electrical lines are down and we have to close school, this is our platform when we put when we uh, exercise our digital learning days. And so with that being said, I want you to know that you can always um, contact your teachers of your students to ask questions, to ask for assistance, and know that when we do use digital learning days, we also extend the time that the student has to turn in the information by two weeks. And so let's say we reopen on X number day um, in March or April. Uh, when school starts back, we're going to give our students additional extended time to get their lessons in. You asked me about graduation. I thought I was going to get out of here without having that. <laughs> Last it was week coming. it was prom, <laughs> and this week is graduation. <laughs> This is what I'll say about graduation. Today, 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 we have not canceled graduation. Today. That's a positive outlook. Okay, that's a positive graduation outlook. Graduation day is what? What's the date? It's the week of um, May 18th through the 21st. It's like the last week in May. Right. Next you're, to the last week You're keeping in May. a positive point We're of view. We're keeping a positive position today. But it is premature for me to make um, the announcement um, of any uh, cancellation of graduation. I don't think any district um, in Georgia has made that decision. I think some colleges and universities have done that, but I will tell you in DeKalb County that decision has not been made today. I will tell you we are behind the curtain looking at alternative options if we have to come to that. Um, but as of today, no, graduations have not been canceled. Okay, I, I feel so badly for all those kids who are missing prom. Uh, here in the, in the month of March and early April, who may, hopefully not, but who may end up missing their graduation. I just, I just ache for them because that's one of the highlights of, you know, growing up. I, very quickly, how do you make the decision and how will you make the decision to move students on to the next grade, seeing how if you have to cancel school for the rest of the uh, calendar school year, uh, how do you make that decision? That decision will, made, will be made under the guidance of the Georgia Department of Education. As I stated earlier this week, um, the State Board of Education will be meeting next week, and they will be making some decisions that will come down as guidance to the local school districts. They will more than likely give some authority to the local systems um, to formulate some systemic written procedures of how they're going to address credits for students. Of course, we're looking very closely at our senior cohort, but we're also looking very closely at our junior and sophomore cohort. The class of 2020 is the critical class right now, but we want to be looking also for the students who are now rising juniors and rising um, uh, seniors right behind them. So we'll know a little bit more in a week uh, what some of that guidance that will be coming down from Georgia DOE uh, and what authority they're going to give to the local systems to decide. And so I would just say to parents, stand by. We are already working behind the curtain, anticipating what some of those decisions might be 
We're not waiting on them. And so we're working steadily now in preparation to really put uh, the finished touches on what we believe what we're going to hear. All right, thank you very much. We are out of time. We've tried to jam in as much information in these two hours as possible, humanly possible, and our, our great panelists have uh, enabled us to do it. I'm going to hear from Dr. Ford, who promises to have a very quick Very, statement. very quick. <laughs> this is a sort of a sidebar that we are seeing because of the physical distancing. We're going to see weight gain, folks, yes. because everyone's sitting at home eating out of boredom and not, and the gyms are closed. And so we need to come up with some ideas to be physically active inside the house. There are and that's of why that nature walking is good. Yes. And that's, I meant to add, add that at the end. So find a way to keep moving because you don't want to walk away from this, you know, issue with 15 extra pounds because you sat at home and binge right. ate. So. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's already started at my place after all that big grocery shopping out of right. panic. Right, like I ate all my supplies. <laughs> now, right, now you got <laughs> uh, this refrigerator and cabin is full of food and you're just sitting there looking at television and, and munching. So exactly. uh, try to try to be healthy and, and get some exercise in. I want to thank our, our panelists again. Uh, again, Mayor Patty Garrett in, from De Decatur, Superintendent Ramona Tyson, Dr. Elizabeth Ford, and Dr. Alexander Isakoff. Thank you all so much for uh, giving us some very, very valuable, helpful information for us to make great decisions. And of course, uh, my deep gratitude and thanks to our CEO, Michael Thurman, for uh, hosting this, for putting it all together. It's a great idea. People need this. You can't have enough, uh, given all of the information that changes by the hour, it seems, or is added to. And again, thank you very much for inviting me to participate as well. Everybody, thanks for joining in. We're glad you stuck with us. Uh, stay well, stay healthy, and maybe we'll see you this time next week for some more information. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening.